Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back uh, to the third and final part of our um, our speed afternoon. Uh, so we're, we're now going to be talking about the important topic of uh, access and uh, possessions. And we've got a slightly different approach here. We've got um, three three speakers. Um, uh, we're going to hear first of all from uh, uh, Jeremy again, Jeremy Hotchkiss, uh, Deputy Director Rail Industry Standards and Capability of DFT. He's had to stand in for Chris Field, who's not been able to 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 join um, uh, us this afternoon. Um, and then we'll have a presentation on access and possessions from Anna Del Vecchio and uh, Paul Harwood. Uh, so Anna is Development Director at McDonald, uh, but also uh, one of the leading figures in the uh, rail supply group uh, and responsible for this access and possessions regime. Uh, Paul is investment director at Southern Region uh, Network Rail. Um, so is uh, Jeremy available? Jeremy, if you want to put your camera on, uh, if you're ready to go, that would be great. OK, you, you muted Jeremy. It's I am available. Yeah, OK, Jeremy, so if I can hand over to you and thank you very much for standing in for uh, standing in for um, uh, Chris, who's I think having some IT issues this afternoon. So so, th so thank you. Would you mind doing a little bit of an introduction to to the topic and then handing over to Anna and Paul? Sure, will do. And apologies, David, I wasn't expecting to go live, so I'm afraid I've changed into something slightly more comfortable. <laughs> in <the laughs> time. Um, but I think I, all I'm so if you'd like me to kick off, I shall kick off now. Um, so this next session is about access. So this is a an important theme um, in relation to Project Speed, um, where all operators have a role to play in helping Network Rail and its industry partners um, get the access to the network that they need to deliver vital maintenance, renewal and upgrades. Um, this is clearly uh, there are a difficult balancing act because um, access is something that needs to be balanced against um, running a network as well. And given the volume of trains operated by the franchise train operators, um, they clearly are um, some key players um, in making any access theme a success. So um, Chris's role, and apologies on behalf of Chris for not being able to be here, um, Chris's role involves him being responsible for how DFT defines the train service that it requires its operators to deliver. Um, so this role in includes setting expectations on how, um, how train operators should interact with network rail and wider industry partners to support maintenance, renewals and upgrade activities. So very much setting the tone for that relationship. Now, I think very clear to us that obviously the industry is in the state of transition at the moment um, from the um, franchising system, which was um, very successful in its time. But I think we know uh, the reasons um, for the change and the new world set out in the Williams Shapps um, white paper. So these reforms um, set out a vision for Great British Railways that would see Great British Railways owning and managing the rail network and providing that single guided mind to deliver the services that are most relevant to rail users, whether they're passengers or freight users, and making these more reliable and more efficient. Now, this vision relies um, just as heavily um, as now on rail operators collaborating with each other, with Great British Rail, and with Great British Rail's delivery partners um, in the rail supply chain. So we're not waiting, we don't need to wait for the reforms actually to tell us to collaborate. Uh, we're doing it now. And as we move from the traditional franchise agreements to the national rail contracts and then onto the post reform passenger services contracts, we're removing um, those obstacles and, um, and incentivizing our operators to work in true partnership with Network Rail and then obviously great GBR in due course, um, whether in train service design, performance improvement, um, or in this theme, efficient access to the network um, so that it meets the needs of the user um, as much as the funder. So in that context, I'm going to bow out 
um, and hand over to Paul and Anna, who will be able to lead the rest of the session. That's great. Thanks, Jeremy. I think I uh, kick off. So Paul Harwood, Investment Director Southern. Great to meet everybody this afternoon. Uh, thanks, Jeremy, and thanks, David, for uh, for taking the helm on the slides as well. So uh, we shall do the next slide, please, thing in a second. Um, and then I've just I've I've got the first slot. Um, Tom Mail's on the call as well um, from from one of our teams who looks predominantly after the delivery work within possessions process. So he's going to do a quick intro to something we're doing in a minute. Uh, then back to me, and then I'll hand over to Anna uh, with a couple of poll questions in the middle, and then we'll go to the Q and A with an even greater uh, cast list. So David, if you can go for the next uh, first slide, I'll kick off with a little bit of. Uh, uh, intro. So my, um, I'm the, as well as the investment director at Network Rail Southern Region, I'm the access theme speed lead or the theme access lead speed, whichever way you want to put those words, um, covering the whole country. So, so I picked this as, as one of the 10 themes. Um, I'm quite close to it, right? My background drives me into the direction of this sort of subject matter. Pretty passionate about trying to, trying to get improvements through here too. So that's why I, I either drew the short straw or the long straw. Um, so a little bit of why have we uh, um, uh, put access as one of the one of the themes? Well, there's absolutely no doubt. So uh, I know you would have been on on the conversation today and, and previous calls. Uh, you knew how we undertook some of the early speed conversations. Um, we identified a range of projects orientated around enhancement projects. Um, but there's one thing that's absolutely fact was it was consistently identified access how the engineering access works. Um, is contributory factor to both time and cost of delivery. Inevitable, uh, and I personally believe it's probably one of the most significant factors um, because clearly operating a, a railway, delivering infrastructure works on a railway of whatever shape or size um, and doing it safely and doing it in a way that does or doesn't disrupt our passengers is fundament fundamentally changes uh, the components of delivery in terms of moving from a effectively a greenfield site type activity to something which we try and do in very, very small pieces of work um, in, uh, in very small periods of time. So it, it came through loud and clear through every one of the projects we looked at through the first tranche, second tranche and, and thereafter. Um, second thought there, renewals and enhancements. So speed is orientated around enhancements, but uh, particularly me sitting in Southern, where we've got a relatively small enhancement portfolio at the moment, uh, need to start thinking forward to renewals as well. And of course, access, engineering access and how we interact with the train service is a fundamental component of both parts of those. Um, so something that was immediately transferable. And, and while not all of the themes that come through on the, en the enhancement world uh, are transferable, there's no doubt that access is one of them. Third point there about recurring opportunity. So I mentioned it's consistently identified, but it was also consistently identified as something that could be done and changed to respond to the speed uh, headline, the strap line effectively, half the time and slash the cost. Um, again, unsurprisingly for those people on the call, they will recognize that you can probably with more intrusive access or different access pattern uh, in some way, speed up project delivery and probably uh, associated cost uh, benefits as well. Um, so it was it was not only a recurring subject matter, but it was a recurring opportunity. It was on pretty much every one of the opportunity logs. The fourth point there, industry trade-offs, Jeremy did a perfect intro for this. So um, it's also great time to think about this differently. Um, things in the past, structure of the industry hasn't always led us to, to making intelligent trade-offs for the cost and value associated with how you deliver projects, uh, the consequences of that, and back to the operational point that, that Jeremy was making. We are in a place now where we can do that. Again, as Jeremy said, we don't have to wait for GBR to structure anything different. Um, a good quality conversation with information about the cost benefits of different options um, will lead us to a place where we can make a better decision, the most informed decision. And then quite often it will lead us to a decision which gives you an option for doing something quicker and cheaper, which responds to the primary speed theme. So there's, there's a lot of environmental factors in there um, come through that, that say not only is it the right thing to do, but it's the right time to do it and think of things differently. Fourth one, uh, there is definitely, I think, a perception and reality that we have actually gone backwards over time to an extent. Some of this goes with a legacy of where we have, as an industry, done a very bad job uh, uh, d delivering a service in terms of not delivering a service for passengers. And we've ended up with engineering works in some way, shape or form that have overrun and destroyed a train service and destroyed people's journeys. Um, the reaction to that in some cases has been to put more caution into the system, into the process, and we lose efficiency, be that, be that through um, the way we take action the way we manage it, the amount of contingency we put into it, or indeed some of the expectations of, uh, of, of people and, and teams activity uh, in terms of maybe resource contingency and so on to driving cost in to, to jobs. That's not always wrong in my, in my belief, 
but it certainly has led to an erosion of efficiency, both in terms of uh, innovation around how we take access and how we utilize that access in terms of the efficiency of the specific engineering access. So um, some of this is, 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 is not necessarily fact, it's, it's a feeling. Some of it is demonstrable. Um, when we get to Tom in a second, it's some of the work he's been doing on DW, DWWP proves that. Um, but but it's, it's also important in terms of a speed theme to not only identify improvements, but to try and reverse some of the trends we've had over the last number of years. And the final point there, um, it, it is almost without fail an area, and, and, and some of the things Anna will talk about picks up on this too, because when we get to this subject matter from a number of different directions, Everybody seems to agree it's an area rich with opportunity uh, and with supply chain colleagues on the call, a um, number of conversations I've had with a number of people over specific projects and some generic engagement. People go um, that we could do things better. It is something we could do better. We could do something quicker and we can save money. So uh, when everybody agrees, I'm a firm believer that we all line up behind it. It probably suggests it's the right thing to try and do. So that's that's my kind of intro. Uh, next slide, please, if I may, David. I'm going to, I can't help but smirk every time I say that, so apologies in advance. Uh, Mr. Whitty has set a bit of a problem for everybody there. Um, right, what have we done to date? So uh, two phases effectively of, of the speed themes so far um, with a break point fairly recently. Uh, and access is an interesting one. So I, I drew the, again, short straw or long straw part way through last year. Uh, and one thing that not dissimilar to a lot of the themes you realise when you dig into it, there's not a lot of restrictions to doing something differently. There may have been in the past, but at the moment when you look at it, there isn't a lot of restrictions uh, to doing something. It's not often process requiring something necessarily. It can be process leads you to, maybe not quite with the DWWP again in a second, there is some specific process requirements in there. But actually, uh, some of it is, is culture, is appetite, is expectation. There's, there's something in there which suggests you don't have to do what we do on some of the other um, speed themes, is actually change the, the sort of um, town planning aspects is an obvious one. There is a clear process which affects timescales and, and affects the rate of project progression, and that will require probably up to statute change to, to address it. But in this instance, there's a lot less that needs to be done to unlock it. Some of it is around doing things in the right order, um, conversations, information, uh, and encouragement to do something differently. So we'll get to some of those points in a minute, but, but we identified that. So what do we do in the first stage up to a few months ago? Um, predominantly focused on just trying to get people's mind around some key principles that we would all stand behind as an industry. Um, and particularly as the, the early stage of speed and speed to date has been clear uh, alignment between DFT and Network Rail. A lot of the work has come between those two organisations. We wanted to align those organisations behind the principles that we're trying to achieve. So it was a good starting point. Then there was an element of best practice of trying to actually draw out because it, it's harsh to say we don't get it right everywhere. It's not true. Um, but we're not consistent and we don't necessarily always take opportunities and we don't um, promulgate those opportunities across other um, projects, project delivery and project opportunities um, because we're not very good at spending best practice. So it's pockets, pockets of excellence. Um, and myth busting is linked in a way because I think there is there is definitely a culture in this space that people assume they can't do something. It's partly because they, they, they have not been exposed to where somebody has done something differently and achieved a different output. So that's where the best practice comes in. Partly because I think they, they have got into an element of uh, it's actually the easiest thing to continue doing what we do at the moment. And, and the myth busting is you don't have to do that. Um, a really, really important point, uh, and Jeremy uh, uh, mentioned it again, um, we have achieved a lot in the emerging, some of it's I guess, unfortunate, why we had to do this, because it's COVID linked in a sense, but, but the formation of the EMAs and the ERMAs in terms of the contracts that the op our operating colleagues are operating under, and then pushing forward into the NRCs, which is the next round of contracts, um, we have got good supporting conditions in there. So not only have we undone some of the things that, that were, they go back a number of years, that's for sure, um, but they were possibly putting restrictions into having a sensible conversation around delivery options. But now we have a contract situation where people are positively encouraged, part of that collaboration point, part of the value gain as a consequence of a point, to have a sensible conversation about the best system solution. So the conditions that we have established that is almost it's almost a tick. We've got a long way to go. We're heading towards GBR in the future, um, but we just need to make sure we entrench that. But the, 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 we have got to a position where there is good support between NR and the operator and, and all the other partners in this conversation um, to, to support the right decision. 
Uh, we then get back to the, the more process orientated part. So, Tom, if you could drop off mute for a second and take over um, and then just talk about what you've been doing on the DWWP process review, if that's OK. Yeah, thank you, Paul. So in terms of what we've been doing with the delivery work within possession standard, uh, for those who aren't aware, this is something that applies to uh, all capital delivery upon the infrastructure, um, aside from work that's considered maintenance. Um, and we've been tasked with a couple of briefs, really. So one is to look at rebalancing the risk appetite between uh, prioritising the delivery work, essentially, versus the priority of a right time handback. And secondly, becoming a bit more efficient in terms of the level of uh, float, if you like, that we mandate as part of the process. Um, so as part of the work streams with speed, we've basically revisited some of this process. So in terms of what we term uh, additional contingency allowance or float to the back end of the work where we, uh, we, we mandate this, this period of time, we've reduced this uh, for both red work sites uh, and green work sites, uh, red being those where there is a, uh, a higher risk of possession over undeemed, if you like, and green uh, where it's lower. So for green work sites, the removal of these controls, we estimate this is going to release uh, an additional two and a half million minutes of productive access time per year, which is a, a huge amount. Red work sites, we are becoming a bit more efficient in terms of how we determine it. So rather than mandating a, a, a float period of 10% uh, capped at three hours, we now put a greater reliance on our risk and value processes to uh, achieve a, a P90% level of, of, of handback confidence, if you like. Alongside this as well, one of the things we've looked at is how we rebalance operational priorities with the delivery of infrastructure. So uh, an example of that is, you know, if we're coming to the end of a possession and actually time is tight, um, but scope of delivery, uh, there's, there's, there's a little bit of work still left to be done, but not quite, uh, not, not able to complete within the, the possession time. Uh, provision has been put into the framework to look at that work, look at where we're delivering it and make a decision there and then as to whether, is it worth actually overrunning slightly for 15, 20 minutes um, to prioritise the delivery of the infrastructure work? Or actually, you know, are we in the throat of a major terminus station where prioritising um, a right time handback is more important to the local operator? So it's things like that that we've tried to become more aware of in the framework. Um, and across the revision to 006 for the DWW process, all of these things should hopefully uh, support with rebalancing some of our risk appetites. Um, putting a bit more efficiency into the mix and hopefully uh, enabling us to deliver more work with the access that we've got. Great, thanks Tom. I think that's uh, back over to me. Um, so, uh, proving there are some process components to it, that, that's the critical point what I was keen that Tom worked through here. We recognise that uh, this addresses directly the point I made before about some of the things we have created our own problem effectively and, and Tom has been working through some of those things. So next next point, um, what we've then done is, is in the obvious reaction to uh, the feeling that some people get it right, some people get it wrong, and there is no such thing as right and wrong in this space. I recognise that, but but we, we do do things differently in different places. Is then um, we put a lot of effort into spreading best practice, supporting the speed review project specifically um, with some guidance, lessons, challenge and ideas. Um, uh, it's worked quite well. We've already had people go, mm, I didn't really realise I could do that. And that's just the tip of the iceberg and, and again picks up some themes I'll talk about in a minute. And we've also set up, uh, is, I believe, is, is a really good way to keep this national theme going, recognising that a lot of these conversations have to be local in nature because particularly you're combining projects, different project types, different environment to do the work in, uh, different uh, service that you're affecting by it. Um, they have to be local, but, but the best way to try and get a consistent attitude to change is to use some champions across each of my regions and regional colleagues. Um, so we get that group together now initially within NR, it will very quickly turn into an industry group uh, to tackle that. Some of this is addressing the fact uh, access is quite a tricky one. There is no sort of practitioner group associated with this. This is something that pervades so many different areas of activity and conversation. But it makes it slightly harder to, to, to make a change to something and, and change, particularly when it's got a softer nature to it. 
Then on this side, the last couple of points is, is effectively where I start to intro what Anna gets to in a minute. Um, then Anna um, first met when you had the RSG Act Now work coming out and the report of reports, which Anna will take through in a minute. But it was it was straight at the heart of looking at some work that had been undertaken over many years, looking at other reports about access, access efficiency and opportunities. Um, and it was coming up with some of the themes that unsurprisingly we were hearing through some of the speed conversations. Um, and then that led to some joint challenge sessions, which Anna will take you through a bit more in a minute. So, so there's a direct link here between some of the things that were coming out of speed, what we've been undertaking, and then where Anna and I have been taking some of the RSG work, which we'll talk more about in a moment. So David, if you could flip to the next slide, please. So then what are we doing next? Um, well, I'm trying to drive a whole variety of things, but I just wanted to put a, a bunch of potential initiatives and thoughts. And this is where I really, we really need the industry to work together and to work out what it is that can change things and, and give us the opportunities and make us take the opportunities. So some of these are my hypotheses that we haven't tested too much yet, but I thought it's useful to share and try and stimulate some of the Q&A in a while. Um, I, I believe that some of our, our challenges with not making best use of access, and, and I'm a bit of an advocate of a multi-activity, multifunctional blockades as, as something particularly in Southern, uh, is one efficient way of doing things where you've got a certain network you can you can take larger slugs of access on. Um, but we actually have made our, our own problem there a little bit because trying to get lots of people with different contracts into the same space, because we have our, our, a lot of our structure, certainly historically, has been orientated around asset type by asset type. So we have a track work bank, we have a civils work bank. That doesn't make it so easy to then try and think differently and think innovatively in terms of working in a geographic space with multiple pieces of work going on. So a hypothesis of mine is we need to be smarter about recognising we might where we might need to contract for access to multifunctional activity in a geographic area, not a repeat um, asset task. Start with demand, one of my favourite ones. I do believe we, 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 we somehow fail because we haven't thought about the demand on our infrastructure that we are affecting by our piece of work. If we start that into the telescope and go, how many people use the trains at that time? So any time of the day on a piece of a piece of infrastructure, um, what freight flows through it? And then the critical bit is what can you do with those things? What can you do with those passengers? What can you do with that freight? That will straight away give us a better in to probably a more ambitious ask for access because you will start to understand that maybe that freight has got a diversionary route. So we don't want to just jump to the conclusion that it's bad to take a big block or a large piece of access there because that freight operator can't operate the traffic. Look at it that way around, look at the demand, look at the next network and you may actually be able to shift that demand. Same with passengers and of course that the pre and post COVID position may well have evolved here too because people will have more flexibility. There is no doubt about it. They're telling us that they're expecting that. I had always underestimated the amount of flexibility that some people have anyway. A lot of it was orientated around the fact that the industry didn't do a good job telling people early enough. We might want to see whether they can change their journey patterns and journey behaviours. Um, there are restrictions to that too, I know. No, there's no doubt about it, but things have evolved. Um, working from home is suddenly an option that people wouldn't have considered before. So it opens up opportunities there. Uh, start with the demand and work out what you can do with that demand. Start early, that's an obvious one. It's directly linked to demand. You don't have to wait until you have an engineering solution before you try and work out what access you need. And I'm a firm believer that sometimes the engineering solution might change if you consider what access you've got. And Anna and I were involved in a, in a conversation just earlier this week about middle and main island electrification. Think about an electrification project, clearance is a key part of it, clearance under a bridge. You rebuild that bridge, it's easy if it's a country lane and you can easily divert the traffic over it. It is not easy if it's in the middle of a town, it's on a bus route, that local authority is going to put some very, very sensible demands upon us, um, which will affect the decisions we make about whether we clear that uh, bridge for electrification by demolishing the bridge and raising it or whether we track lower. So a direct link between the demand on an asset and how you decide to change that asset to deliver what we're trying to the output change. Um, next one, uh, Schedule 4. So don't please get distracted by the Schedule 4 point. This is my point particularly around renewals. I don't believe we have good price signals to make decisions around access because people will know we do not allocate the cost in Schedule 4 terms for renewals to the project. So we're missing a big price signal there. So I believe we need to do something about that to get the better pricing or the around schedule for what it represents, which is disruption to passenger demand, directly linked to decisions around projects and how they deliver. The other bit about price signals is, and what are the different options going to deliver in terms of different efficiency, not just the time, but the cost. So we're not, I don't think, very good, and it's because of the sequence we do things to get the price signals out there to go, um, if you let us rebuild it in that way rather than that way, actually we can save you an awful lot of money and time. 
I don't believe we have a very educated conversation there. Quite often it's network rail's fault or doing, we're probably thought was the wrong word, too harsh, but we are driving people too much in one direction before encouraging the thoughts, options and, and, and innovation uh, and the price signals to, to sit on the table and go, let's make some decisions about what work we're doing and when we're doing it. Technology is, is more directly affecting the efficiency of delivery. So things about how we take possessions, take them and, and hand them back. Five pillar assurance, this is very much from the supply to the ridiculous, so that the technology is a very tactical issue. The five pillar assurance is part of the process we've been undertaking in Southern to look more widely than just, in inverted commas, engineering, delivery and assurance. It's around communications, the train service, maintenance around a piece of access, how you operate the railway around a piece of access. You can do a lot there to address some of the things that what Tom talked through in terms of DWWP, we put some of those contingencies in for because we, we have poor quality support for a piece of access sometimes, which then inevitably makes the industry decide we don't want significant access because we've got a greater risk of destroying the train service as a consequence. If you put the support and assurance around the service you provide, you get people's support for more significant interventions. It's my belief and it's, it's been proven by what we've achieved over the last couple of years. Last couple, lockdown scope is a fairly obvious one and everybody will hate change and you get that lockdown earlier, you can have a more credible um, access conversation sometimes. Um, the challenge to normals is back to the point about the fact, somebody used the term in a meeting I was in yesterday that we let gravity take hold quite often and gravity in the access world probably leads to less intrusive because more intrusive often means you get a bad reaction. And people don't like a bad reaction, probably for good reason sometimes, but that tends for people to make a cautious approach. And therefore the point about gravity is you then drift back down to the easier option or the more conventional option, which in many cases it appears is probably less efficient and less uh, and not as quick. Um, and then of course we get to, this is my segue, because this is my second to last slide, uh, to what Anna's going to introduce in a minute in terms of the key things that are directly linked with all the activities I've just talked about. So David, next slide if you can please, is just a couple of points on this one. Um, I just wanted to make the point that, that this is partly how I think about it, but I think that it's important to make the distinction and it links to the poll questions we've got in a minute. Um, I think of these in two sectors. There are strategic considerations as to what axis we take to do the work. That's a very early conversation or it should be. And there are tactical considerations about how efficient you are when you have that access. Um, they are clearly intrinsically linked because if you improve your efficiency when you take your access, you need less access and therefore your strategic decisions change. But there are very different solutions for both of those, I believe, and we've got to work them both. The feedback loop works, but you've got to improve the efficiency and that gives you more opportunities to make different strategic decisions and different considerations. So that was all I intended to go through. I hope that made some sense. And we've now got two poll questions. Uh, so David, if you can flick to the next slide, please. Um, I understand these are relatively straightforward and I think a link will appear somewhere to enable you to undertake these poll questions. Um, one thing I need to point out, the title here doesn't occur, accord with the question they have flipped round. So this is really more an access efficiency conversation. Um, so the question being, what do you see as the key challenges to achieving improved access productivity and value? Um, and then we've got a range of options in there, but I, this is where Anne and I were, were considering what, what we're really trying to get under the skin of. And there are two key questions that we want to understand. What stops? some of these innovative uh, conversations and realisation of different opportunities uh, from being discussed, being introduced, um, and in this instance being deployed when we are actually using our access. Uh, I might need to plead for somebody to help me out if I should say anything else about how the poll works or if everybody's actually got access to that now then I can stop talking. I've stopped talking. Ah, excellent. It sounds like the results should be appearing soon. David, you have that, that concentrating look that suggests you're somebody that's trying to get the, uh, the results up. Fantastic, thank you. Ah, this is uh, uh, both <laughs> useful, unfortunately, possibly not a surprise. Um, because the collaboration point, um, again, I know I've been talking about this for many months now, um, and sometimes when you sit in a workshop uh, and try and understand why a decision was taken, you do feel 
that somebody wasn't encouraging the right conversation. Hence my point about not only is it the right thing to do anyway, but it's also a brilliant time to start working on those sort of issues in terms of uh, calling out in a good way when something somebody feels they're missing an opportunity. Uh, second one, their cultural behaviours. Uh, it feels like it's intrinsically linked to an extent. Um, interest in the standards is, is a relatively low rated one. It's back to the point, I don't think it's process necessarily and, and, and certain requirements that control that. Processes does feature on there. Um, site practice is an interesting one. Uh, innovation, that's something we need to fuel. So quite, quite even across a number of them there, but it's interesting that culture behaviours and lack of collaboration is at the top there. So if we can flip, uh, David, to the next poll. Thank you. Um, and the next one then is more about uh, access strategy. Um, uh, what is it that has stopped us, this is particularly interested in, in um, not having taken an opportunity that was available? So trying to understand again, get under the skin of what it is that's stopping us as a collective, um, gaining the value that I think we, we could gain if we get the efficient delivery solutions uh, out on the table early. So we uh, just do the poll now, thank you. Fascinating again. Um, this is always tantalising where it updates, especially if I start to comment on it and then find that it immediately updates itself with a different position. But there, there's clearly front runners already emerging, um, which again, probably and unfortunately doesn't surprise me. Oh, this is interesting. Time is uh, rising up here. Um, yeah, targeting our reaction that that both doesn't um, doesn't surprise me and worries me but but that's because um we, we don't get ourselves into the right place sometimes i don't think and sometimes we don't necessarily uh, with, with my train operating colleagues um i don't believe we we help them understand what the consequences of the different positions are anyway so we as a collective are not very good at, at actually informing that debate um, and when you get into that position and understand how much value and opportunity might be associated with it um you might get a very very different position this is interesting that they're, they're coming up on the rails now, um, which suggests we've got a diverse range of problems to solve as well. If uh, if we uh, we've got a bunch of issues in there, right, Anna? That's probably the point. Thank you, David. That's great. Um, to hand over to you, if that's okay. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, David. Um, I'm Anna Del Vecchio, Development Director here at Mott McDonald, but I'm also the RSD Champion for Productivity. Uh, thank you for giving me the opportunity to come and present our emerging work that Paul and I and others have been working on, especially on this hot and sunny afternoon. So hopefully I'll try and make this quite quick in terms of the presentation. So for me, this is the start of the journey, not the end of the journey. And we're really keen to work with the supply chain, uh, network rail train operators and others to really drive through what we need to do around access, productivity and efficiency. So just to give you a little bit about the RSG and some of its context of how we ended up to where we've ended up today around access and productivity. So um, the RSG secured in partnership with many uh, a while ago a rail sector deal which is fully aligned to some of the workings that we're seeing now, whether that be William Sharps or key focus areas. Um, we also, I'm not sure whether you're aware, the RSG, the Rail Supply Group, and government set up a COVID-19 task force last year to really look at how it could look at the sector's recovery and build back in terms of what it needed to focus on to be able to make sure that it that it recovered and that it didn't have specific challenges. So what we did as the Rail Supply Group in partnership with others is we held and delivered a Rail Supply Group survey where lots of participants highlighted what they felt the challenges or blockers or challenges were, were around the pandemic. So um, it identified three core areas that were our right now priorities. One was around certainty, the other was around data and how best we utilise that in the sector and the third one was 
access and sector productivity about how the sector could be more efficient and productive in what it does. Um, it's perfect timing to start looking at this initiative. One, because you've got the Network Rail Project Speed Programme and access is part of that. So what we're keen to do is not duplicate, but join forces to understand how we can target the ones that deliver the most impact. And it's also even more timely of the Williams and Schatz review. There's a whole section around access as we transition to Great British Railways. So again, I see this as real a great opportunity for the sector to come together to be to deliver something that perhaps was um, a challenge before in the past. Next slide, please, David. I'm so not used to saying that. So just to give you a bit of context around it, what has the RSG been doing um, in terms of the RSG coronavirus task force that was set up? Where are we? What's the journey today? So this is a really quick accelerated programme of some of the work that the RSG has been doing. So before we looked at what we needed to perhaps highlight and fix around access and productivity, what we did is we conducted a review of all the previous railway reviews of access and productivity and they dated back over 10 years and there was at least 12 different reports highlighting some of the opportunities as well as challenging and it gave us an idea around areas that perhaps were fixed or areas that were still outstanding to look at what we focused on to drive impact. We then agreed a partnership with Network Rail, DFT and others and what we did is we set up a task and finish group where we had members from RIA, Rail Forums Midlands, Rail Delivery Group, Network Rail and some of the supply chains to start working on the detail and some of the success of how we've ended up to where we are today is around that collaboration of coming together in one and really looking at how we can fix those specific challenges. Um, it's great to have the work of the Rail Supply Group recognised and part of the Network Rail Project Speed Programme and Paul and I talk incredibly often on a week daily basis around some of the opportunities and feedbacks that we get around access and possessions. Um, so what we've been doing with the RSG and Network Rail over the last couple of months is we've held a number of what I call challenge sessions around in, in both Eastern and Southern, looking at how we might improve access productivity. And we categorised it into three areas what we did at access planning stage, what we did at taking access, what we did at delivering the work. And what we did is we didn't just take a typical project because in the railways, right, there never is a typical project. So what we did is we looked at projects that have already been delivered and one or two projects that are due to come out imminently. And what we also looked at is any variations between renewals and enhancements project. And the whole process was really enlightful in terms of understanding some of the opportunities as well as the challenges. What we've now done is we've got a framework of our Act Now initiatives, which I'd just like to show you as part of the slides as we evolve. And this is a great opportunity for the supply chain to really help us drive those changes, you know, come forward with compelling ideas. But most importantly, I see access and what we need to do here as a whole industry approach. And if we can get this right, I think it'd be absolutely game changing. You know, the ambition is there from all the previous context slides that I gave you. We now have a, a plan and what we've got to try and do is demonstrate how we can be more efficient and how we can reduce the UK PLC Rail cost stack in all that we do. So one of the key areas that we're looking at is um, looking at potential proof of concept by working with Southern and Eastern, which I'll go on um, to a second shortly, but it actually gives us an idea of how we can work in a pandemic and a post pandemic world that perhaps we wouldn't have considered before. So it's a great opportunity to put some compelling cases forward about areas that we might explore. Next slide, please, David. So the poll questions were not by chance. So given some of the um, activities that Paul and I have undertaken at the challenge session, these are some of the key themes that we identified. And 
obviously the wheel starts surprise surprise with collaboration and contracts so it really doesn't surprise me that that has come out as number one and just reinforces some of the work that we need to do so some of our findings based on the access challenges sessions that we had around value and productivity can probably be summarized in these areas so there was a lot about how we could work better more collaboratively and having longer term frameworks but because perhaps sometimes things just take too long and that isn't criticism of any individual or any organization how you know how do we speed up that cycle there was a lot around you know how we can be more effective from a site practice perspective our processes sometimes you know they're challenging lengthy and are they out of date are they fit for purpose what do we need to do there was a whole piece on standards and you know we were quoted all sorts of interesting stats and figures around how long it takes to get a standards challenge approved so there's a whole piece around standards innovation as well came up as a key theme and most importantly the culture and the behaviors came up that actually individuals felt that they, we needed to work much harder to embed a different culture and behaviours in what we do today. And the other bit that you see on the left hand side is decide and do. We have to be quicker and more responsive in what we do um, and how we make that happen. So in summary, from the challenge sessions that Paul and I held as part of the RSG in partnership with many, we came to the, a number of conclusions those areas are fundamental to drive efficiency and cost productivity. They're dependent and they're interdependent. If you fix one, you, it could impact the other area. So we have to look at how we do this collectively. Um, it's an opportunity to think and work differently compared to perhaps how we did before. And I see it as an opportunity with a door open on how we can generate efficiency and why. We've also got to look at risk versus reward and how we make that better than what it is today. And something that was a key theme that came coming through time and time again was one team, one sector mindset. We felt that on occasions when we did the independent challenge session, sometimes there was them and us, or how do we really fix that so we're one team trying to drive efficiency? let's not forget customer is king so what are the you know what are the customer impacts and how can we get better in strategy and delivery of what we need to do and i see this as a great opportunity to energize the sector and challenge the sector to change the status quo it's down to us to make that change and drive that efficiency and if we do it together i absolutely believe we can be more effective and efficient in all that we do whether that be time cost people or resources and most importantly it's evolution so we need to look at how we plan what we do and how we move it forward david next slide please that's kind of the what and then I was often asked when I started to look at this with Paul you know why are you doing this what's the reason why access and productivity is important and we felt when you look at access and access strategy there's three key components around access one is the cost in terms of what we do and how we do it and that's challenging cost and expertise from everybody in the sector to understand what we can do better the second is the time that it takes in order whether it's conventional whether it's a blockade whether it's weekend working and how we can be more efficient in what we do and most importantly the customer you know how do we really improve that customer experience and how do we make sure that we minimize delays in all that we do and pick the right option but most importantly why is access productivity so important well the railways is one of the most valuable publicly owned assets uh, what we have to do is we have to demonstrate to the taxpayer, our customers, that we're efficient and productive in all we do and that we put forward the most attractive and compelling costs and time propositions when we look at business cases and, and other activities to get those investments through, whether it be enhancements or other works on renewals. So this is down to us to try and fix this challenge. But we have to look at how we drive that efficiency and that always just isn't about cost that's about how we might do something differently and think about 
how we structure the works at strategy stage and also the impact to the customer. But the customer might not be, like Paul said, the person that gets to the train. It might be the local authorities where we need to shut the roads at a local level and the congestion that that creates in terms of some of the stakeholders. So we really need to think about these a lot more compellingly um, as we move forward. Next slide, please, David. So what next? So this is really the first time that we've been able to share it because we've been really working out what areas of focus that we should be looking at. And um, I think it's fair to say on when we did the um, challenge sessions, there were good practice as well as areas that can be improved. And I think that there is elements of excellent practice where Paul and I and others in the team have really seen, but it's not consistently adopted or adapted across what we do. But there's great good practice there that actually we can apply to other things. But there are obviously areas that we need to fix. So you know, what are the next steps? How can you help us? So what we've agreed to do, the Rail Supply Group in partnership with Network Rail, DFT, others, RIA, Ralph Forums Midland, is we've agreed with Southern and Eastern to deliver a number of potential proof of concepts by working differently. So what, what does that mean and how do you get involved? So for Southern, we're committed to building off the challenge sessions that we had. We must, and I'm sure Paul will echo this, we must change the status quo for efficiency time and passenger demand reasons. We've got so much opportunity. And this is an important one because this is something that you can all act now rather than um, it imminently be in the future. Want to hear from teams already involved in the development of the work and pushing through different ideas and suggestions around access, productivity and efficiency, whether that be strategic or tactical. Paul and I and the team would be very interested um, to hear. But equally, if you could please push these through your normal project contacts, if you get you know, if you get if you don't get a response or you need to talk to Paul and I, please, you know, pick up the call to the RSG task and finish group, Paul and I, because we can all have that opportunity and start to change our status quo today in order that we should we shouldn't have to wait a year or two. I think we can all play our part in doing things differently. Um, we're going to explore a, a range of projects um, in a bit more detail in Southern. But what we're going to do is we're going to deliver a structured approach to change in the way that we deliver in partnership with the sector. And it's I go back to that really, really important point. This is a great opportunity for the sector to come together and we're only going to fix this as a whole industry approach. So on Eastern, I'll go through this very, very quickly. Um, we've also partnered with Eastern. We're not looking at several projects. We are looking at Midlands mainline electrification um, and we're revisiting the principles that underpin electrification of the network. We're also challenging ourselves around, you know, what is game changing? How do we deliver midweek versus weekend uh, versus blockades? Um, and what we're keen to do is facilitate some cross industry expert panels to tackle the conventionalism and the art of the possible. So Paul's not wrong. We had one earlier this week and it was really great to have that access collaboration and discussion early on. There was so much great content that came out of it. So I guess the question um, is, how can you help and how can you get involved? Well, you can initially help that if you're all working as part of projects on Network Row and you identify an opportunity to be more efficient, please try and push that through your normal project contacts. If you fail to get a response, you know, please come back to the RSG. Paul and I would be happy to discuss those. And in terms of how can you help? Obviously, this has been a 10 minute accelerated uh, presentation where we focused on it for probably six months. What we're keen to do is um, I've asked RIA and RAL forums to set up um, some supplier sessions that we can go through in a little, more, a little bit more detail and also share any best practice and ideas that you've got now around access strategy and productivity. So that's it from me, David. If I could hand back to you ready for the panel session. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Anna and Paul, and also Tom. Um, if I could ask my panelists to turn their cameras on so that I can uh, uh, I can uh, see them. I'm afraid the audience will only be able to see one person at a time, which is a bit of a shame. But uh, um, Anna, Anna and Paul, would you mind turning your cameras off and then back on again, as I've lost connection with you, uh, and that'll hopefully restore connection. That'd be great. Um, so thank, thanks uh, to um, to Anna and Paul and Tom. Uh, Neil, you've been uh, you. Uh, if I can introduce, well, I'll ask you to introduce yourself, Neil. But you've been sat in uh, uh, quietly listening to that. Um, from a from a train op, uh, train operator perspective at RDG, what are your thoughts on this 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 initiative? Thanks, David. Um, as Anna has alluded to, I've been involved with the uh, rail supply group uh, work uh, as the RDG, i.e. the train operator member there. And, and I think uh, Paul's alluded to it already, the opportunity that the current ERMAs and the new NRCs that TOX are moving to offer us a once in a generation opportunity to get this right. They are now actively contractually obligated and encouraged to be network, percept, network perceiving and to look at the whole system. They are now disencouraged to look purely at the bottom line revenue for themselves and they are encouraged to look at the total system approach. And I think that's a good thing. We've also got some good uh, experience with some of our operators, uh, operators that Paul works with closely in uh, Network Rail Southern, but also operators on uh, Network Rail Northwest and Central. We've got some very good emerging behaviours by some of them, uh, some of them who represent, for instance, a single majority customer for a Network Rail route, and some of them who represent a cohort, a collective of customers. And all of them have got some very good ideas, and some of the preconceptions that some of the old hands in Network Rail might have had about attitudes to talks about not running particular trains or not running particular trains on particular days. Those I think are now obsolete and I think we need to uh, encourage that new conversation between TOX, FOX of course, because they're just as important as TOX uh, and Network Rail to actually uh, give us the opportunity to have uh, more possession time, to have possession time on different days of the week, different times of the day. And so I think we're actually in a very good position here. That, that's really positive and, and, and that echoes uh, what Anna was saying, which is, you know, towards the effect of, ch you know, ch challenge the paradigm. So the um, so I've got a few questions from the audience here, if I could uh, if I could uh, um, ask colleagues to to pick those up and I'll, I'll um, so th there was, um, this is an interesting one. This is one about short range planning, I would say, uh, which I think Neil might have had a go at, uh, at answering. So I'll maybe ask Paul to, uh, to, to also have a look at it. So it's more access could be released if there was more pragmatism applied to access requests that come in at T minus 14 uh, or T minus eight, which uh, for 12 and eight hours respectively. Uh, unless there's a safety issue, there's apparently a blanket ban on access being granted at relatively short periods, even if the possession is available and the project can be demonstrate that uh, the work can be done without uh, disruption or safety risk. So this is about, you know, is what are your thoughts about um, short term opportunities like that, Paul? Thanks, David. Yeah. Um, a lot of this hooks back to, to live conversations, particularly we've had over COVID about informed traveller, informed traveller timescales, because we drive a lot of the, the, the timescale expectations around the view, be it right or wrong, it's certainly right in places, that we, we, we have to respect our customers and give them good advance notice. That's got to be right as an underpinning theory, but I think that there's a view that that's not, it's not, it doesn't need to be that consistent. And by that I mean a lot, so I'm, I'm working Southern, predominantly a commuter base, uh, although obviously that's shifting a little bit too with the leisure travel. Um, but there are different factors in play there we should be a bit more tactical about in terms of um, whether people really do respond to that much notice and indeed whether they need it. So I, I, it, it's, I'm always a little torn because I'm, I'm protective of some of things. Your you question, uh, question mentioned safety, and that's something that always worries me about short term because I'm try we're trying all the time um, to, to take out some of that 
we have a terrible habit of, of introducing too much short term change and it definitely brings risk to work sites. It brings, it brings risk to interaction between work sites sometimes, but that also isn't, isn't good reason not to do it. It's a reason to be cautious about it. And, and the question is said, we have to do it safely and we can demonstrate that. So I, I have over the last year, so it has been very different situations, negotiated often with an operator at my, at, my, at my side right at the start when they've agreed they want the work done quickly, negotiated things in at very short notice for the sake of, of, a, of a handful of weeks. It is possible you can prove you're doing it safely and particularly over the last year where therefore it's challenging the informed traveller issue. Um, we, we, it doesn't, um, it doesn't even worry anybody quite so much. It might, interestingly, it might have worried, um, we had some challenges from our, our, our colleagues a little bit because they were then protective of the, of, the, of the status quo. But in that instance, we were trying to use an opportunity where demand was down to get some work in there quickly. So I think it, it proves the logic of the, behind the question that we should be careful and innovative and, and sorry, creative and innovative, but we do need to be careful in the way we deploy it because we don't want to cut off some of the good reasons which are in place to protect those timescales. So, so uh, th thanks, Paul. If I could uh, put a question to, to Tom. Um, the um, So, uh, Tom, what, what are the can you are the particular sort of success stories that you can point out there from the uh, work that you've been doing? You know, have you, you know, have you been are you measuring how how you've been able to drive up productivity, for instance? You know, have you got particular examples? Yeah, that's a really good question. I think, and actually, just echoing Paul's comment, I think there've been some really good examples in the last year. Um, the one that comes to mind is the Kilsby Tunnel blockade up on Northwestern Central. Or actually, you know, we we did bypass some of our more stringent timescales around planning and integration and things like that. But equally, corners weren't necessarily cut. So, not saying that's something that we can do for you know ev every piece of access or blockade that we're doing. But there is something that um, that my team have taken into the review of the DWWB process to sort of relax some of the controls where it's applicable to do so. Yeah. Okay. If I can ask a supplementary uh, that uh, uh, first to Tom, and, but Neil might want to come in on it as well. One of, one of the things it might have been in Paul's list of initiatives, but it wasn't expressed in quite the way that I think about it. A hobby horse I've had for years um, is that we don't think about um, um, productivity in terms of the units of delivery that we can achieve you know so for instance what I mean is if you go out with a certain uh, you know if you're thinking track renewals which I used to do once upon a time if you go out with a certain resource you can deliver let's say 800 yards but the possession might only allow you to deliver 700 yards although actually the client might only want you to deliver 700 yards um, so it's like an opportunity cost of 100 yards uh, for the price of you know some sleepers and rail um, so what I'm thinking about is you know, in that trade offs should one of the first questions we ask is what's the equivalent unit of what's the sorry efficient unit of delivery and I just wonder if you if you're thinking about it in that in, in that way. If I look at it from a from an assurance overhead point of view which is primarily where my process sits with this. I think you know, one of the things we've done is we've retuned the processes so that actually those methods of delivery that carry least risk in terms of possession overrun and, and you know, di disruption to the network are by their nature now given uh, less of an assurance overhead. So for example, you know, a, a type of track renewal that carries, that, that's using a methodology uh, with equipment that is perhaps a bit dated and you know, it has a, a higher failure rate than some others we are being more cautious in terms of the controls, the contingencies that we put in place. Equally, um, you know, if a supplier can demonstrate that they're using a methodology that has a high success rate and you know, there are safe methods of delivery in terms of um, you know, mitigating risk of, of, of impact to the, to the network, then actually we can squeeze that contingency time right down and enable them to deliver a higher unit rate during that possession. So David, maybe I can take that from a different direction. So if that, if that 700 yards versus 800 yards decision was made on the assumption that, for instance, the TOC or the FOC wouldn't give up the 1145 train off of Waterloo and that that assumption wasn't challenged, 
then it needs to be challenged because actually nowadays, maybe and probably the top will be prepared to either trade off the 11.45 p.m. for Waterloo, but maybe they'll be, a, be, be prepared to trade off the 5.30 off, off Wimbledon Depot in the morning. And those trade-offs and those assumptions that we've got embedded in our culture need to be, need to be challenged because if it's only an extra half an hour of possession that you need, and you're making an assumption that that half an hour won't be given, then let's challenge that. David, it's and that, could, could I could I just add a little bit too? Sorry, it's it's such a good one. Um, there's, there's because it does come back to my point about price signals. Neil, Neil was getting out of it as well because I'm not sure, and, I, and I, I don't believe it's that somebody doesn't want to tell us. It's that we don't, and are often don't give somebody the opportunity to tell us, and then I certainly don't get the information to give to an operator. But if we can get that on the table, your point about actually there's a tipping point there where you, you are under delivering uh, because of X, Y, and Z reason, and it becomes more efficient if you increase the volume or in some cases decrease. Uh, and Anna will remember the middle of main line conversation we had on Monday, let's touch straight upon that. Somebody helped with a really great piece of analysis talking about the number of shifts to deliver a certain wire run and, and, and distance and so on. And that helped drove us straight to an optimized duration, which straight into the space that Neil mentioned. It doesn't automatically deliver it, but we've got all the critical pieces of information available then to go, we know we can get much more efficient, use the resource which we've just cut off because we've cut it short by an hour to do a lot more work which then cuts off the overall access requirement anyway it was a direct trade-off you need less access overall to do the work but we're not fueling that conversation often because we're not asking the question or somebody's not providing that that critical piece of information but if we can get into that space uh, neil uh, again hit the nail on the head we, we can get the conversation to that point now and go what why do you have to run the what was always the old one out of waterloo the 115 or something like that under southampton um, where most people didn't really want to have to run it. <laughs> there might be some passengers that want it, but they're probably quite happy to do without it. And, so. and are you are you getting so so? We heard earlier on about early contractor involvement, and you know the thread running through all of this has, has been about uh, collaboration. Um, so there's clearly a lot more dialogue between train operator and network rail. Uh, how can we really get the three-way dialogue going where we can make the trade-off between uh, train operator, network rail and the supply chain? You know, bringing those, it sounds like you just gave an example of it there, Paul, but um, so maybe if I could turn, well, Paul or Tom, if you, um, how do we get that three-way dialogue going? It, it, it's, if I can, it, it's, it, absolutely, we've got to. We've just simply got to. We don't. We don't do it. I, I don't think. Then I can probably count on one hand the number of meetings I've been at where our, our supply chain have been sitting there with the train operator talking early enough about the different dynamics of of delivery, particularly on some of the bigger projects. Like the electrification ones are great examples because they are there's a, there's a production line element to it to an extent. Um, we should do that right from the start. Early contractor involvement is so right from the appropriate point, but as long as it's early enough that we can shape it. And where we got to, I don't want to overwork the middle of the example, but it was just so recent, was then we were looking at the different sections we were electrifying and they will have different characteristics. And the part on one section, somebody will probably go, you can go for the maximum production line accessibility at that point because we can come up with a solution which moves the demand away. But there I'm afraid you can't. So it's fine, we're very clear. And it will be driven by what we do with what is our collective demand that we're trying to satisfy is moving people and products. So, so absolutely, we have to get into the same space. I'm never quite sure why we don't. Um, uh, sometimes it's just culture. Sometimes it's some sort of fear about exposing one part of the conversation to the other. But I'm a, I'm a bit of a whole system believer. We just need to have that conversation openly and understand where the value sits and we'll make much better decisions. Thanks, Paul. Um, I'm just give notice of what's going to be my last question because we're running over a, a little bit. I'm going to ask Neil to add to that question, but to give you all notice of the last question, I'm going to ask each of you to say what's the one thing you'd want the audience to take away from today um, in terms of next steps. So, uh, Neil, do you want to add to that, uh, that pre previous question? Yes, I think uh, a big electrification project or a big new signalling project, East Coast Digital South, for instance, those are the key examples where there should be early engagement, not just between network rail and their suppliers, but also the customers of network rail, which are the Tox and Fox together 
mediated by network rail with the suppliers to network rail. There will be stuff that the freight and uh, passenger operators on, for instance, East Midlands can do that network rail won't have thought about and put them in a room with the suppliers and they'll come up with all kinds of weird and wacky ways of running their diesel only trains today, their future hybrid trains so that we can have a productive and pragmatic rollout of the OLE. That's uh, uh, productive and pragmatic. They're, they're two good uh, good words to take, to take away with us. Anna, I think you wanted to come in very quickly before I get that last question. Yeah. Yeah, David, it was back to your previous point. We can't afford not to do the three way conversation and discussion because we've got the reason why we're doing this is we've got to be more efficient and productive in what we do. And we have to fill that triangle and we have to work out how we can partner and collaborate much, much earlier around having informed discussions and conversations about areas that we can improve and areas that we can progress. So I think we can't afford not to do it because the supply chain is integral to what we do. And I guess I know that you were going to ask the last question, but I guess for me, we need the help of the supply chain to make this happen as well. It is only going to work if you've got the three, not the two. OK, thanks, Anna. I'm going to take that as your as your takeaway thing that we need that we need to <laughs> you need to ask the supply chain. I uh, could give you a list, but let's just help help us would be my one thing actually. That that that's a great one. Um, Tom, what's the one thing you'd like us to take away? I think you know, looking at my particular area of focus, acknowledging that there's there's work going on around the the obviously the wider subject of access, but. Looking at you know the access that we've got, I think some acknowledgement that we're doing what we can at the moment to um, you know, maximise the access we've got available and make efficient use of what we've got. Thank, thanks, Tom. Neil, what, what's the big takeaway from you? So we've got a once in a generation opportunity presented by the recovery from COVID and the move away from revenue driven franchises to customer driven concessions uh, that currently DFT and, and, and in the future Great British Railways are going to put tox on. So that's a once in a generation opportunity for us that we've got to grab. Otherwise, it will be 20 years before we get something as good again. And Paul, your, your big takeaway for us? Um, it's the request. Um, to, to point out where we're wrong. And, and by that, I mean, put energy into reminding us where there's a better option and it might not get mentioned. Because I, I, it's often, I bet people know it and we, we haven't enabled them or they haven't felt the need to, whatever the reason, all the reasons we talked about earlier, contracts and so on and so on. As Neil said, the opportunity is there to do it. So I'm asking everybody, please tell me when I've got a different option. Give me the price signal as well. It's a great time to do it. Thanks, Paul. There's a, there's a number of questions that we haven't been able to, to deal with, but I'll just sort of paraphrase a, a couple of them because they might be relevant to the, the things you might want to take away and think about. There's a question about um, the RNEP process, the, uh, um, which we might see in the next few days. Who knows? The, uh, so the rail Nash network expansion uh, enhancement program and, and it's questioning whether we're building in 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 inefficiency because projects get decisions get delayed. So I think there's the generic concept that uh, delayed decision making costs time um, and money. Um, there's the uh, point about can we look to uh, experiences from abroad, which I, I hope you're doing, and also the point ca how can the schedule for money go around be removed in, if, in advance of GVR being established? Well, I think it already has been. Uh, so, um, and the time to get possessions on on uh, electrified lines. So the you know what can we do to speed up uh, the time to. Uh, take and give back possessions and isolation. So a few things which I'm sure you're already thinking about, but just in case you uh, uh, the new I highlight them. Um, I need I need to draw things to a close uh, now. We're nearly at five o'clock. Just to say thank you to the uh, my current speakers, to Neil, to Tom, to Paul, to Anna, uh, and also to Jeremy for the his int his introduction. Um, 
very uh, good and important discussion. Um, I hope uh, the audience is taking away the message. There's, you know, the words about efficient, productive, pragmatic, once in a generation opportunity. But overall, the theme that runs through all the speed um, initiatives is challenge the paradigm. You know, the the uh, the government and network rail, the rest of the supply chain, they we're open for challenge. So. Um, you know, as several of the speakers, most recently Anna and Paul have, have said, um, if you see something that you think can be done better, then try and push it through. And if you don't feel that you're uh, not getting the right hearing, then uh, there's channels to come to. Uh, Anna, Anna has put a hand up for that and Anna and Paul put their hand up in the case of possessions uh, and, and access. But if it's other issues, then we can help you find the right place people to speak to. Uh, so, you know, ask, ask Ria too. Um, so I, I'm just going to close in thanking our speakers. So if, again, if you can manage in that, that virtual round of applause, Thank you very much, uh, folks. Really, really good, uh, good presentation. That rounds out the nine themes of uh, of uh, Project Speed. And uh, if you haven't seen all of them, like all good uh, streaming shows these days, it's available on Catch Up, uh, and we'll be we'll be circulating the links so that you can uh, watch it on uh, Ria's answer to Netflix. Uh, so. Uh, thank you all uh, and have a good evening, everybody. Thank you, David. Thank you. Thank you, David. That's great.